One of my favorite hymns in our supplemental hymnal is titled Meditation on Breathing. It's written in three parts, so it's difficult to use as a congregational hymn and impossible to suggest with a single song leader while we're still locked down and streaming. But every so often, it just drifts into my mind and I find myself singing it and smiling because it soothes me. The words are simply this. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. It has little to do with my topic this morning, which is understanding theology, but you will have to continue breathing if you intend to join us for worship, so give it some thought. Good morning, and welcome to First Jefferson Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm the Reverend Annie Furster, minister to this congregation here in Fort Worth, Texas, and I welcome you whether you're an old friend or a first-time visitor. If you wish to be placed on our mailing list, contact administrator at firstjefferson.org. In the meantime, let's begin this morning's worship with music. Our call to worship this morning is titled Grounded Someplace Deeper and was written by Mark Ward. Reason is an important tool. Sure, an essential arbiter of truth claims about the world. But religion is grounded someplace deeper where we experience the joy of living and are connected intimately with all that is. Religion is an entirely human experience, but one that we get in touch with using some pathway other than intellectual argument. In religion, we seek to address not just what is, is, but also what we hope for and what we dedicate ourselves to. We rely on it to navigate the shoals of love and grief, compassion and estrangement, Gratitude and disappointment, mystery and wonder. As the Reverend David Bumbaugh suggested, religion deserves reverence. It requires a vocabulary and a theology. And this theology demands no intervention of unearthly forces, but invites us to open ourselves to different ways of living and learning. It considers, quote, the human, unquote, a niche in the vast intertwined plentitude of being. And just what is our niche? We are fragile, fallible sorts for whom just being is a blessing and love is a pole star. I want to light our chalice this morning with a reading from David Rankin called Popularity. I think you'll enjoy this. Our worship is not an entertainment. Our congregation is not an audience. Our music is not a concert performance. Our preaching is not a trivial comfort. 
Our theology is not a marketing strategy. Our counseling is not a promise of prosperity. Our church is not a business enterprise. Our ministry is not a cult of personality. Our community is not a gathering of sheep. Our success is not a membership statistic. And our theology is a covenant of mutual trust and respect, which we invite you to share. Please join me in singing our opening hymn. It's number 86 in the gray hymnal, Blessed Spirit of My Life. Our lead singer this morning is Brian Skinner, and our pianist, as usual, is Misha Beresnev. Blessed Spirit of my life, give me strength through stress and strife. Help me live with dignity, let me know serenity. Fill me with a vision, clear my mind of fear and confusion. When my thoughts flow restlessly, let peace find a home in me. Spirit of great mystery, hear the still small voice in me. Help me live my wordless creed as I comfort those in me. be my legacy. Ah, yes. Please join me in saying our covenant, which begins with love. Love is the doctrine of this church, and the quest of truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation. Thus do we covenant with one another. The service this morning comes from so many questions that you have asked me that I almost don't know what questions to ask you to consider before we start. This may be a difficult topic for some, and yet I'm considering making it a part of a series. So instead of a question for you this morning, let me make instead a suggestion. When you hear a word that you disagree with, or one that brings up bad memories, creates confusion, or you simply don't understand, would you please try to silence that noise that comes in your head that disallows you to hear what follows? I know it's in my head as well, and it takes discipline. So after I'm done speaking, you may shout as loudly as you care to, to disagree with or reject anything that I say. Now, I'm not meaning to hurt your religious sensibilities this morning. I'm, trying, I'm going to try to find some mutual understanding. So come on this journey with me, and you may be surprised at the scenery you discover on the way. In the meantime, let's start with a story for all ages that I call Roasting the Ham. This is a story I heard a long time ago. I don't know who wrote it. I remembered it and wrote it up out of my memory. So if someone wants to take credit for it, please let me know who did this delightful story. It was Papa's birthday, and Mama was making his favorite dinner, roast ham and sweet potatoes. Molly was watching Mama prepare the ham as they chatted about their day. 
She had the baking pan out, and nearby was a package of light brown sugar and a can of pineapple rings, just the way Papa liked it. But first, she put the ham on the cutting board, and selecting her sharpest knife, she cut about two inches off of one end, and then she turned the meat and cut another two inches off the other end. Then she put the meat in the pan and sprinkled it with brown sugar, and she was arranging the pineapple slices when Molly suddenly had a question. This was the way Mama always made baked ham, but she had never thought of the question before. Mama, she asked, why do you cut off the ends of the ham like that? I know you use them to flavor soup, but is it necessary to the recipe? Well, Mama stopped what she was doing, and she dried her hands on her apron, and she said, I don't know, as if she were surprised at the answer herself. It's the way I was taught to make ham, the way your grandmother told me to do it. I've always done it that way, but now that you ask, I'm not sure why. And the two of them stared at the truncated roast as if it could tell them the answer. And then Mama said, I'm going to ask your grandmother, and she picked up the phone. Hello, Mother, she said into the phone. Do you have a minute to answer a question? Molly just asked me why I cut the ends off the ham before I roast it, and for the life of me... I can't remember why, except that's the way you always did it. Well, there was a silence on the other end for a moment, and then Molly's grandmother said, just as Mama had said, I don't know. It's the way I was taught to make ham, the way your grandmother told me to do it. I've always done it that way, but now that you ask, I'm not sure why. Mama laughed and then shook her head. It's a mystery then, she asked. It is, but I'm going to call your grandmother and ask her. I'll call you back. Well, Mama reported to Molly that her grandmother didn't know why ham roasts were prepared that way either. We've just always done it that way. But there has to be a reason. Well, in about 15 minutes, the phone rang, and Molly could hear her grandmother laughing as if she'd heard the funniest story she'd ever listened to. I know now why we cut the ends off, she told Mama, still laughing. Oh, for heaven's sake, said Mama, tell me why. That's what your grandmother said when I asked her, Molly's grandmother said. She said, for heaven's sakes, what a silly question. And then do you know what she told me? She said, when I was a bride, the only roasting pan I had was 10 inches long, and the hams were always about 14 or 15 inches wide. So I cut off the extra bits and threw them in the soup. And when I got a bigger roasting pan... I quit doing it, but you must have left home by then. Don't tell me you're still trimming the ends when you have a perfectly good-sized pan to cook the ham in. Well, when Mama heard this, she began to laugh, too. She hung up the phone and she said, Molly, you're not going to believe this. And then she relayed the whole story to Molly. They laughed and laughed together. Three generations of women were cutting off the edges of their hams without knowing that the first woman in the family didn't have a large enough roasting pan. But you know what? When Molly grew up, she often fixed roasted ham with brown sugar and pineapple slices for her family. And before she put the roast in the large pan she had received from her grandmother as a wedding present, she sliced off two inches from each end because it was a family tradition. And when her daughter was old enough to help with the cooking, she told the story to her, and they laughed together as they trimmed the meat. I love that story, because I know my family had traditions like that, things we've always done, and no one can remember why or how they started. Like my uncle, always offering to say grace at the dinner table and then saying, Amen, Holy Ghost, the one who eats the fastest gets the most. And then the rest of the family would say, Oh, Fred. And I always thought that, Oh, Fred was another mysterious word like Amen. A lot of things get handed down like that for generations until someone suddenly thinks to question them. And you know what? Religion is that way. Some of you know we got the name Unitarian because earlier generations of, liberal, of a liberal faith tradition disagreed with the concept of the Trinity, saying it wasn't in the Bible and therefore wasn't legitimate. 
And we got the universalist name because earlier generations of another liberal faith disagreed with John Calvin's belief that only a pre-selected few would get into heaven while they held out for universal salvation. And over the centuries, the two names have come to stand for unified faith welcoming all regardless of faith or creed and universal regard for the faith of others. You see, ideas change, language changes, concepts evolve, and sometimes people don't keep up with the changes, and you might hear them say, oh, I don't believe in that, or argue fiercely, that's not what it means. Well, religion, for the most part, doesn't get studied by everyone. It's sort of passed down from parent to children, or picked up from books, or maybe online. You might say amen, and I might say amen. Or we might not use the word at all because we have no idea where it came from or what it means. Well, I knew a family of modern pagans who ended their prayers and blessings with the words, blessed be, only to have the young daughter tell me one day that those words made her so happy because she could just picture in her mind that blessed honeybee flying all the way to heaven to deliver their message. And I still have that image whenever I hear the phrase, blessed be. And here's where it gets really confusing when it comes to religion and religious language. Unitarian Universalists come in three varieties. Well, no, of course, there are hundreds of different versions of us because we insist on mixing our experiences with our beliefs and we all have a wide variety of experiences in life. What I mean is that Unitarian Universalists come to the faith in three different ways. There are what we call birthright Unitarian Universalists, meaning their parents had already been practicing UUs before they were born, and they were brought up in a Unitarian Universalist Sunday school. And then we have those who were raised in another faith and who became disenchanted or disenfranchised for some reason and switched to a Unitarian Universalist church later in life. We call them come-outers, coming out from another faith. And the third variety are those who were raised without a particular faith community and as adults, and often when they become parents, begin looking for a place to find spiritual comfort and inspiration. And they are often referred to as come-inners. Now, it's not important for you to remember these names or even to try to figure out where they came from and why. My point in mentioning it is that because we come together from three different poles of religious training, we don't have a background of language and ritual that we all experience or accept. We don't have an understanding even of what each other seeks or finds here in this creedless but accepting faith. We agree to covenant with one another, to hear one another and not reject another's faith if it differs from our own. But beyond that, we are often blissfully ignorant of religious history, ours or anyone else's. Even the word covenant has a religious background in Christian churches as agreements between God and his creations and would be rejected by most Unitarian Universalists for that definition. But we have used the word successfully for so long to mean mutual promises that few argue with its religious implications. Covenant. By combining its religious definition with its legal definition, it's a concept that implies extraordinary commitment and a bond stronger than blood. But other religious language doesn't fare as well sometimes. Often when we should be listening for the deep meaning behind another's and our own experiences, we begin to argue over a word we use to describe them. A few months ago, we were having a Zoom session of adult religious exploration, and the term theology came up. And someone asked if we had to believe in a particular God to understand whatever it was we were talking about. And most of the discussion group said they thought the word theology meant only an understanding of God and didn't have anything to do with the discussion. I think at the time I was the only one in that particular group who thought the word had a broader, more evolved meaning. But there wasn't time in the discussion to explain what I meant. 
and thus this morning's service was born. And I'll have more to say about religious language and especially about theology when I come back. But for now, a reading titled The Theology of Love that was written by Dawn Fortune. My theology understands humanity as simultaneously fragile and resilient, weak and strong, greedy and generous, mean and compassionate. I see the divine spark and the tension between those opposites. I see the divine in the generosity of those who often have the least to give, in kindness offered by those who would arguably have the most reason to be bitter. The divine is like love in this regard. It's irrational, unexpected, and beautiful. Please sing with me again. The song is called, No Matter If You Live Now Far or Near. And if you're reading it from the hymnal, number 181 won't get you the tune because we're going to sing it to the tune of hymn 64 with which you are more familiar. Don't let it bother you. You'll get it. delighted when I learned you could take the words from one hymn and put them to another. There's a way, if, if you ever get a hold of a hymnal, you might want to look at this. Down in the lower right-hand corner, there is a set of numbers that gives you the rhythm of that song. And in the back, there would be that same set of numbers, and it will tell you how many hymns can be interchanged with that rhythm. Absolutely wonderful. So... Unitarian Universalism is a religious denomination. Let's just start there and then ask what that means. Merriam-Webster defines religious in this way. Religious, an adjective. One, relating to our manifesting faithful devotion to an acknowledged ultimate reality. Two, of relating to or devoted to religious beliefs or observances. 3A, scrupulously and conscientiously faithful, and 3B, fervent and zealous. Now, somewhere in that melange, there must be something you can pin to your name tag. But here is the rest. Religion is a social cultural system of designated behaviors and practices Morals, beliefs, worldviews, texts, sanctified places, prophecies, ethic, or organizations that relate humanity to supernature and transcendental and spiritual elements. <sighs> However, there is no scholarly consensus over what precisely constitutes a religion. I think I've told you this before. Scholars have tried to come up with a single definition for religion, 
and they have admitted defeat. But I don't find that a negative condition. I find it delightfully expansive, a playing field that allows infinite levels of exploration. And if faith and belief isn't about exploring, then to me it's about nothing at all. And now, theology is about the study of religion. More accurately, from the dictionary, one, the study of the nature of religious belief. Two, religious belief and theory when systematically developed. And three, a willingness to tolerate new theologies. Now, with all of that, we've got a platform to stand on while we look around, while we chew on this word and get a taste of what it really means or could mean to each of us. Until about the 17th century, the term applied to the study of all religions throughout the world. But about then, it became associated with Christian religions and their gods. Until then, it hadn't meant to be selective, but to be universal. And those who don't consider themselves Christians or have some history with that particular belief system are quite justified in thinking of it only as a justification for the teachings of Jehovah and Jesus. But it didn't start out that way. Theology is a systematic study of the nature of the divine and of religious belief. It is occupied with analyzing the nature of religious systems that are about life and love and leading lives of pure intent. Theology includes various forms of analysis and argument, including experience, philosophy, history, ethics, and law. Arguments often assume the existence of previously resolved questions and develop by making analogies from them to draw new inferences in new situations. According to Wikipedia, theologians believe the study of theology helps them more deeply understand their own religious traditions, another religious tradition, and may enable them to explore the nature of belief without reference to any specific tradition. It may also allow us to explore other possible ways of interpreting the world. Okay, that's about where I'm standing when I say the word. I am become a theologian of my own belief system. Like professional theologians, I try to look at my own beliefs as a unified system. Why do I believe this and not that? What is my philosophy about why this happens? For instance, why bad things happen to good people, to name a common question. What does my theology demand of me and how does it lead me to act consistently and with pride in my actions? That discussion I talked about where this question came up was about having a theology that allowed us to act on our own beliefs, even when the common social belief tended in a different direction. This is about ethics, about morals, about justification for your behavior, about understanding the feelings and needs of others in this stew of creation. I have to have some understanding of a larger personal system before I can justify my own stand and speak out of my own learned and earned beliefs. So when I say theology, I don't assume any particular God or lack of one. It is much larger than that for me. The themes of theology might include a study of the divine and whatever that means to you, but it also includes a study of humanity, of the world, of how things began, how they might end, and how we might be saved for the better life. According to one demographic, there are an estimated 10,000 distinct religions worldwide. And about 84% of the world's population is affiliated with either Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, or some form of a folk religion. Now, I don't know where that particular demographic places Unitarian Universalism, but I would bet that out of our history, 
We are a part of that 84%, and I would like to include them all among my friends rather than my enemies, but I would be equally interested in understanding the remaining 16% as well. Well, let's leave it there for a while before your brain begins to hurt. Statistics tend to be sharp and painful when you try to take them apart and analyze them. Let's let them lie there for a while and tenderize. In the meantime, every Sunday we celebrate a communion of names and milestones, the stories that live in this community. And I want to read one that was sent to us this week. It's from uh, Jude Olson, and she wrote, After 34 years in Texas, Jude and Bernie Olson are moving to Aurora, Colorado to be nearer to their grandchildren. Two grandsons in Castle Rock, Colorado, and one granddaughter in Chicago. They are building a new home in a 55-plus community called Inspiration, selling their house at the end of May and leaving Texas by mid-July. They express their heartfelt appreciation for being part of the First Jefferson Church community for more than three decades, including raising their daughters Carrie and Kristen here. And we will, they will take wonderful memories with them to Colorado. And Jude wrote, we will miss volunteering and worshiping with you. And she signed it with some blessing hands and some appreciation faces. I'm still concerned about the terrible war that has been going on in Gaza. I listen to the news and I am so disturbed by the statistics. I mean, we can say 250 people have died in this 11-day war and it just rolls over us, but then you hear 60 children have been killed with the senseless bombing. And I want us just to keep these people in mind as we have now um, a ceasefire that has been going on for three days and we hope will continue until things get settled down again. In the meantime, let us keep the stories that live in this community in our hearts and in our minds as we go our separate ways throughout the week. Let us take a moment to just close our eyes and sit in silence with these stories, the ones that have been spoken and the ones that are yet untold. And then we will have some meditation music to continue with. Shall we go back to talking about theology? 
When I use words like theology, words that you may have rejected from your lexicon or didn't understand from your lack of propinquity to it, do not think I'm, it means for me what I was taught to believe it meant by the faith community I left behind as a child. I have no disdain for that community, nor disregard. I left only because it no longer fit me, no longer allowed me to wrap my experience around it and include it in my own life. But by using the same language base that former faith community uses and other faiths around me use, it allows me to stay connected to the people, if not the doctrine. I use religious language to understand everyone better. I use it that we not become enemies, but become co-creators of our various worlds. I use it to honor their beliefs as I wish them to honor mine. I use religious language because the whole of faith, the use of religions, plural, the understanding of quest and love is so much larger than any of us as individuals and so much more important. Do not let your own faith shrink wrap you. Do not let your cherished beliefs limit you. Do not envelop yourself in spiritual disdain or creedless narcissism. You are larger than any of these. Let yourself be included as you explore the myriad ways of being human, because religion is a human trait. Do no harm to others and do not disdain them. You do not have definitive proof that your faith is more justice-seeking, more soul-defining, more compassionate than any other in the world. Live in it, knowing you reside next door to others who are just as sure about their theology as you are. And when you have found a spiritual home that fits you, that fits you who you are now, that is the best time to explore religious language, to explore other faiths, other ways of being in the world, and to grow your own personal theology and allow it to help you be the best person you can become. To be, in the common vernacular, the person your dog already believes you are. The next time I take up this theme of religious language, I think I'm going to start by exploring the words in our covenant that begin, love is the doctrine of this church. What does doctrine mean to you? How does it fit in your theology? If I say the word theology often enough, will you find a definition that suits you, one that allows you to say it without a pucker of distaste, one that invites you to keep exploring? And what about doctrine? Please join me in our closing hymn, from the Teal Hymnal number 1014, Answering the Call of Love. This used to be called Standing by the, the Side of Love, but we realize that there are people who are limited in their physical abilities who can no longer stand, but are still on the side of love. And so we sing it, answering the call of love. promise of the Spirit, faith, hope, and love abide, and so every soul is blessed and made whole, the truth in our hearts is our guide, we are answering the call of love, hands joined together as hearts beat as one, emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim, we are answering the call of love. Sometimes we build a barrier to keep love tightly bound, corrupted by fear, unwilling to hear, 
denying the beauty we felt. We are answering the call of love. Hands joined together as hearts beat as one. Emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim we are answering the call of love. A bright new day is dawning when love will not divide. Reflections of grace in every embrace, fulfilling the vision divine. We are answering the call of love. Hands join together as hearts beat as one. Emboldened by faith, we dare to proclaim we are answering the call of love. We are answering the call of love. Answering the call of love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. I breathe out, I breathe out love, and we hold it in our hearts as we extinguish the flame of our chalice. Theodore Parker is one I quote frequently, and I think he has a lot to say with what I've been talking about this morning when he said, the ours, a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere. Its temple is all space, Its shrine is the good heart. Its creed is all truth. Its rituals are works of love. And its profession of faith is divine living. So may it be in all our lives.